Well, good evening. If you'll stand with us this evening, we're going to sing There's Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to assemble here tonight. God, I pray that you would uh, bless the tithes and offerings that are about to be collected. God, and that you would use them for your honor and your glory. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Jesus never lived 
If you'll stand with us again this evening, we're going to sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. the 
sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall Thank you. You may be seated. Love those songs. Man, praise the Lord. It's good to see you all here this evening. I um, know that maybe the weather deterred some people, but praise the Lord, it didn't get as bad as what I think uh, was anticipated. Praise the Lord. Uh, also, I want to remind you to keep the um, Garcia family in prayer. Uh, we stopped by the... Um, uh, the funeral home before church tonight, and, and uh, just uh, give them our love, and again, just remember the prayers, uh, remember them in your prayers. Uh, also, tomorrow at 1.30, just a reminder, if you didn't get uh, a text or an email, uh, at Greenwood Funeral Home is the service for uh, Miss Angela's mom. Um, so, well, if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn over to 2 Timothy, and uh, just share the Lord didn't direct me any other direction, is what he put on my heart, First and Second Timothy. Um, you know, I, I believe we found some great notes along the way uh, in 1 Timothy, and, and uh, we'll get those uh, collaborated and put together, and uh, if you want to print them out and put them on your refrigerator, or remind them, I'm just joking. Uh, no, it's, it's really good to have those things in mind. Hopefully, you took notes along the way, and we're here, um, but I just want to uh, remind us of a couple things uh, concerning this next letter that he's, he's written uh, to Timothy. Uh, again, he's writing as a mentor. Uh, he's called himself the, the, the Timothy, his son in the ministry. Um, but we'll see that Timothy's faith may have come from somewhere else. But speaking more as a, as a mentor, a spiritual mentor probably to Timothy uh, is what that means. Uh, but he's writing here from Rome. And he's writing from a Roman dungeon. Uh, the first time that he went, uh, he was in a, in a rented house and no doubt still under Roman custody, uh, appealing to Caesar. Uh, but this time, Paul's head is on the line. Uh, this is essentially his last letter, his last epistle. And again, uh, if you will, his, his farewell uh, in the ministry. And so we, we have to get that context because this letter can be so inspiring. This letter can be so encouraging uh, in this context. Uh, it can help us see that in, in even our lowest place, uh, similar when we went through Philippi uh, Philippines, the Philippians um, a couple years ago on Sunday nights, um, we see this letter uh, given encouragement in his lowest state. Um, and so I, I, I find a, a lot of encouragement myself in the ministry, but as a Christian period uh, from the things that Paul is inspired to give to Timothy uh, here. So let's pray and we'll get into the second letter uh, to Timothy and I. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for uh, the blessings uh, that we've already experienced, the opportunity to worship you through song, uh, to worship you through our giving. God, we thank you for just the blessings you pour out in our life that uh, we can gather here tonight freely and, and uh, just give to you our all. And uh, just there's a song we just sang, uh, our life and our all. Uh, Lord, help us tonight to be freely um, open before you, willing and ready to receive of your spirit the things that you uh, want to give to us, Lord, from your word. Again, we're thankful for this opportunity. Pray that you're glorified tonight, and Lord, that we'll take from tonight what's necessary and needed in our lives, and we'll not only take it, but we'll apply it, and we'll praise you for all that you do. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. So 
this letter is believed to be written around 67 AD, again, from a, a Roman prison. And it was primarily to encourage or to exhort, to strengthen Timothy. Uh, but we, we're going to see an overwhelming theme inside of this, this overwhelming theme of, of steadfastness, of faithfulness in the face of difficulty, in the face of hardships. Um, so if you have your Bibles there in First Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll just begin reading in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. I just want to stop for just a second and remind you context of this. Paul's in a Roman prison cell. He's, he's on the chopping block, literally. Uh, tradition says that he, he will eventually be beheaded. And so he's here in, in a very low, in, in human terms, a very low state of affairs and, 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 again, coming to the end. And here he's writing to Timothy and he's telling him, listen, I've served God with a sincere heart, with a sincere conscience, with a pure conscience, and here's where I'm at. I am thanking God always, night and day, every time that you come to my mind, I'm thanking God for you. And he goes further in verse 4 and says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother, grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that in thee also. Again, right off the bat, there's so many things to, to point out in just these first few verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Again, Paul's thought of Timothy's distress above his own circumstances. I just want to share this with you. I'm not trying to gain any sympathy or anything like that, but this is the burden that pastors and ministers often carry. Um, they, they go through circumstances. We are real people too. We go through valleys. We go through struggles ourselves. But the reality is this. Oftentimes, those, those circumstances, those valleys, those things are set aside because there's so many other people that we love and we're concerned about. And I'm not trying to sound pious. I'm not trying to sound holy or anything like that. I'm simply saying that's just the reality. And so when you, you, when you, when you have this, this picture that, that Paul is, is, is given to us, again, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is a very clear reality of what ministers go through. He was in prison, but he was thinking about Timothy's distress. He was facing death, but he was thinking about the tears that Timothy was shedding. And again, to understand what Timothy was going through, uh, Ephesus, the, the city in which you know, he was ordained to, as the pastor of, of that church, um, was, was a thriving city, was the, maybe the, 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 the central focus of all of Asia at that point in time. And there was a lot of problems. You know, we're, we're not studying Ephesus right now, but there was a lot of things that Timothy was facing, uh, not only from the secular environment that was there, but also from people who were professing believers, and so, and we'll get into a little bit of that tonight, but uh, again, this, this weight that we see that Paul's carrying around exists in ministers or pastors' lives no matter what. I told Rochelle last night, I was driving home um, and, uh, from, from visit, and I, I said, you know, um, there's not very many places that, that we can go that the thoughts and the burdens aren't there. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to be... Uh, open and transparent with you. Uh, the Lord's been, uh, you know, good and blessed us. We've been able to go to Disney World um, as a family. And I told her, I said, I think the, the, the best place that we have truly like unplugged and gone to a different reality, if you will, has been Disney World uh, because it's, you know, it's a small world, small world after all. But um, that was corny, I know. But um, they, uh, it, it truly is an unplugging and going somewhere else. And I said, you know, no matter where we've gone, what we do. I mean, if you're sitting on, on a beach trying to relax somewhere, honestly, you know what the thoughts come about? I wonder how so-and-so's doing. I wonder, I, wonder, I wonder how they're dealing with that loss. I wonder how they're, you know, they're struggling in their marriage or whatever. You know, that's just, it's there all the time. You know? And so, um, again, Paul, we see this as, a, as a, again, a reality of what ministers face, but it's also a great example, not just for ministers or pastors, but for Christians in general. Because we see Paul 
illustrating preferring others above himself. He, he could be wallowing in self-pity. He could be saying, listen, I, I've, I've given my all for the gospel. I, I counted everything but loss. I did all those things, and look where I'm at. You know, you're out there free. Other people who I've led to the Lord are free, and, and, and I am paying the price for everybody. We don't hear that grumbling. We don't hear anything. We hear love and joy and thankfulness, even encouragement for somebody else's distress in his lowest state. And I want us to think about this. Who better to encourage someone going through a difficult time than someone else who's been there? Or in this case, someone who is actually there. Think about that. Somebody who not only has gone through something, but somebody who is there in a dark, difficult place. Not saying, who's going to care for me? But how can I care for you? That's a different mindset. That's a different thought process. But I want to suggest this. It's otherworldly. It's heavenly. It's the exact same mindset that Christ took on. And again, Paul is illustrating that in his dungeon place, in his dark place, he's in this. Again, it's a beautiful picture of what true Christian love, brotherly love, looks like. I'm the one in prison. I'm the one facing the sword. But my concern is more for you to experience God's grace and God's mercy and God's peace. Remember, that's what, that, that's what the greeting was. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. But again, a beautiful picture. My prayer is for me, number one, to be there, but also for all of us as a body to be there. I'm not saying that we don't face real feelings in going through the difficult times. I'm not saying that. It is real. And, and, but in our difficult time, I pray that we would try to take on that mindset and that heart set to say, you know what? Maybe in this place, God has me here to, to, to maybe make me a little more sensitive, maybe to make me a little more uh, thoughtful about others. Matter of fact, God, in this place right now, who can I be an encouragement to? What a mindset. What a, what a thought process. Instead of saying, God, who can you send to help me? God, who can I help in, in my distress? Maybe somebody going through something more difficult than me that I, I don't even realize. Again, Paul had, in this, in this moment, again, recalled Timothy's sincere faith. He said, listen, I'm calling to remembrance your, your, your legacy of faith as well. And that's vital to see in this as well because if we don't think our trust in God impacts the next generation, we're fooling ourselves. See, when things get tough, who do our kids see that we turn to? Who do our grandkids see? When things are difficult in our life, who do they see that we run to? When, when there's an abundance of things, when, when it's not just so low, but when there's an abundance, when blessings are abounding, who do our kids see that we thank and praise? When there's a need, when, when there's, a, when there's a, 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 a financial need or a health need or a, a relational need, when there's a true need in our life, who do our, see, who do our kids see that we rely on? But what about this? In the day-to-day even the little things, what do our kids see? What do our grandkids see? What priority do they see that we put the Lord in, his body? You can't separate the head from the body and his mission. What does the next generation see from us? What is, who is priority in our life? Because that's how our faith is illustrated. I read a poem recently, a response to the question, what if you had but one year to live? I'm not going to read the poem tonight, but what a thought. What, what an amazing thought. What if, what if God himself came to each one of us tonight and told us exactly? I mean, just to make it personal, God came to you. He said, you've got one year. You knew from today you had one year. What would you do? What would your life look like if you knew I had one year to live? Would you spend the rest of your time Pursuing temporal pleasures? They say, oh man, I would go here. I would empty my bank. I would do this. I would buy that. I would go there. Would you spend every moment in these temporal pleasures and pursuits? Or would you realize that you were in the last minutes in comparison to your life? The last minutes of your life. And you can invest in the life that's just beyond the door of death. 
Would that be your mindset? So I think sadly there's a lot of people that would, and I'm not saying that I'm what, uh, exempt from that, but there's a lot of people that would be tempted to say, well, I, what about this? I've never got to do this or this, or I've never experienced that, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. There, again, that, the temptation of the flesh might be there. The temptation of the world might be there. But what, what would we do? Would you invest? Would you be that example for your kids, for your grandkids? that would leave a legacy of faith that would last well beyond your departure. Think about that. Paul knew where Timothy's faith, the, the legacy of faith come from, his grandmother, his mother. It was alive in Timothy because it was real in his, in his grandmother and his, in his mother. But that's how we would live. If we knew we had one year, say, yeah, man, Brother Kyle, I would do that. I would... I, if I knew I had one year to live, man, there's, there's, there's coworkers, there's family members, I would be begging them. I, 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 would, be, I, I would be doing everything I could. I would, I, would, I would give more effort to the testimony that I had. There would be, I, I would give every single thing I, I could do to, to invest in the life to come just beyond the door of death. I would do that because, man, I, the reality in my life is I've wasted so much time. I've wasted so many opportunities. If that's how we would live, then why would we wait? Why would we wait? Why would we wait until we got that disease? Why would we wait until our health was gone? Why would we help till, uh, wait until something catastrophic in our life came and shook us to the core? Why would we wait to live like that? Because you know we don't know what, lives beyond, what lies beyond today. A day, two days, a year, I mean, we have no idea. We don't know that for ourselves, and we don't know that for our kids or our grandkids, and that's another spin. That's another flip of it. What are we investing in them while they have time? What example are we setting for them while they have time? And that's a hard thought process to take. I know as, as, as a dad, it's hard to think about that. We have one opportunity, and it's today. I know for me, I've wasted too much. I, I feel like that, I, and I feel like I've missed too much. I feel like that I've, I've swung and, 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 and struck out more oftentimes than I've connected. I don't believe anyone who truly has put their faith in Jesus Christ, knowing what the death and the resurrection means, and we looked at that Sunday, would be content to just say, you know what, yeah, I've missed a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I've... I've I, I, I've swung more than I've connected, and, 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 but you know what? That is what it is. I, if, you've, if we've truly understood the death and resurrection, truly put our faith in Christ, truly believe the life is to come, truly believe what Christ said, that we can store up treasures in heaven that moth and rust can't even touch. If we truly believe that, then why, could we, why would we ever be content with just saying, well, it's not a big deal? Paul was in a prison cell. In a dungeon, still investing in the kingdom of God. Still considering other people above, above himself. Let's look on in verse 6. It says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of hands. So in light of this sincere faith, in light of what you have and has been handed down to you now, and that's, that's in you, remember the gifts that you've been given. Spiritual gifts of God to use for God. And in that remembrance, fan the flame of those gifts burning at full flame. The, the passion of serving God, of using what God has given you for his kingdom and for his glory, keep that, keep that, fan, that, that flame fan. Keep it burning at full strength. In other words, you have true faith. It's real in your life. You know what that's like. And God has gifted you in a special way, unique way, so that you can serve him. So keep that passion. Keep that in your mind and live it out every single day. That's the same charge that every single one of us should take personally. Listen, if you're saved, you've been forgiven, you've been redeemed, you've, you've been given gifts of God to use for him, for his glory in the church to strengthen the body. I was telling somebody, somebody that the other day. We have to remember God has given us these gifts 
to use in the body to edify and encourage each other, to build each other up. Why? What's the purpose? So that we're effectively accomplishing the mission that he's left us here as the body to accomplish. But we, we have got to, we've got to use the gifts. We've got to use everything to invest in them. That's what Paul's saying. Say, listen, you're going to face all kinds of things. You're going to go through a lot of difficulty. You're in distress right now. Tears are in your life. You're, you're in a difficult place. But listen, you've got to remember the faith that you have, the legacy of faith that's been given to you. You've got to remember that you've been given gifts to use for the kingdom of God. So keep that in your mind and keep the passion to use those gifts full strength in your life. It goes on in verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or, or, or timidity, but of power. And of love and a sound mind, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. It doesn't look like Tim, that Timothy's getting any type of um, coddling here from his mentor. He's not saying, listen, I realize it may be tough to minister. I realize it may be, may be uh, difficult at times to, to give the gospel to people. I, I realize, hey, listen. I'm in afflictions because of the gospel. I'm in bonds because of the gospel. I realize it may not be popular. I realize it may not be fun in the flesh. But listen, be a partaker of it. The afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought to life and immortality, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So again, Paul's charge comes from his reminding Timothy of this gift, and not only just the gift, but the opportunity with the gift that God has given, and not only the opportunity, but the purpose for which he is to serve the Lord in this unhindered passion, this unbridled passion. He gives us the reason as this. Here's why you are to do this. Here's why you're to serve God with a gift of the passion that's unbridled. Here's the reason why, because God didn't give us a spirit of fear. God didn't, God didn't save us. He didn't give us his spirit. He didn't give us the gifts of the spirit. To just to, 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 for us to go around our lives and I, I can't do that. Oh, I, that's not for me. That's not my gift to share the gospel with people. He didn't give us that. He gave a spirit which is a spirit of power and love and self-control. So don't become paralyzed in fear. Don't, don't shy away from the calling and the purpose that God saved us for. Don't be crippled in that. But think that even the affliction that might come from being obedient is worth it all. It's worth it. Matter of fact, if you suffer anything, if you go through anything in your passionate service for God, we should see that as a privilege. We should see that as an honor. Not something to shy away from, but an honor because we're saved. We're saved according to a holy calling, according to a divine purpose that was decided well before we existed. Not by our own goodness, but by his grace. So if we ever lose sight of the fact that service for Christ is a privilege, no matter what it cost us, we've left off that place of gratitude to the work that he did on our behalf to give us salvation. If we ever see, let me say that again, that's, that's note number one. Note number one tonight. If we ever lose sight of the fact that service for Christ is a privilege, no matter what it costs us, imprisonment, health, whatever it costs us, that it's a privilege to serve him. If we ever lose sight of that, then we've left off that place of gratitude for the work that he has done for us to give us salvation. See, because if, if we operate every day with gratitude for the salvation that we've been given by grace, then we can serve him and we can be faithful in our service no matter what we go through, no matter how we feel, no matter what comes against us because of the, the, the gratitude that exists, that place of gratitude that we, we, we operate in on a daily basis. Because we leave off that gratitude just like anything else, and we talked about this in, in, in the first Timothy one, 
If we ever lose that place of gratitude of what God has done on our behalf, not just in the temporal, but the eternal scope of things, if we ever lose sight of, of that gratitude, if we ever leave that, that place of gratitude, where do we start to go? We start to go to that place of entitlement. We start to go to that place where we think that, that we deserve certain things. But again, remaining in that place of gratitude, we can serve God no matter what comes against us. Remember, he, he abolished death. He brought life and immortality to life. He, he brought it to us. He gave it to us through his death and resurrection. It's something given to us by God. And this gift of immortality, this gift is truly a gift. We have to remember that. It's a gift by grace given to us through our faith. Again, without the gospel, without the gospel, the death and the resurrection, the Bible says, again, we saw this Sunday, we are yet in our sins. Without the work of Jesus Christ, we are still in our sins and still left to pay for our own sins. So what measure of gratitude, what a gift that was given to us. And if the Lord so freely give, gave to us his own son, not, not someone, his own son, he will, willingly gave and willingly shared. Why would we not willingly share that same gift with others in need, with others in darkness? Why, if God so freely gave to us undeserving lost sinners, why would we, why would we not in turn share that? I've said this before, but think about this. Whether it was your mom, whether it was your dad, your grandpa, your grandma, aunt, uncle, friend, Pastor, Sunday school teacher, son, daughter, somebody was willing to share the light of the gospel with you. Somebody stepped out of, of, of what maybe they wanted to do and he said, no, I got saved at church. The, the preacher was preaching, doing what he was supposed to do. Listen, the preacher, the preacher can, can do something that he wants to do as well. Aside from preaching the gospel, aside from preaching the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a lot of churches that do that today. Somebody cared enough to share the gospel with you. And because of their willingness, because of their obedience, because they realized it was a gift given to them, not to keep and to hoard up for themselves, but to share with others, you and I were redeemed and saved. And I've shared this before. Think about it. That, that person who's in need. You may not know who they are. That person ready and searching. I shared just a, a month or so ago, walking into a, a, a health store, getting just some vitamins, ready, just doing my business. And, and I'd prayed that morning, God, use me as a vessel. God, you, you know, bring some of my way that I can share the gospel with today. Um, or, or let me run into it. I mean, just use me. I didn't know that it was going to be in that store. But I walked into that store, and, 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 and some of you already know what happened. Walk in, and I had a church shirt on. I say, are you some youth minister or something? Oh, I used to be, you know. And they said, we got a question for you. We, we were just talking about what happens after life. The after life. What do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Amazing. You know, pray, pray. Pray, the, pray those prayers, and I promise you if, you, if you say, God, you've given me this gift, you've given me the light, you've given me the gospel, I, I know how I'm saved, and if nothing else, I can share how I got saved with somebody else. We just got to be willing, we got to be obedient, we've got to do, even in our darkest time. And again, he's charging Timothy, he's, he's encouraging Timothy, listen, do what, what God has called you to do, it's a holy calling, it's an eternal purpose. It was, it, it was brought to us through the grace and the mercy of, of Almighty God. We, we've been made sons and daughters. You've been given this privilege, this gift to serve and to share with those in darkness and, and keep that passion alive. Keep that passion burning bright. But he goes on about the gospel and he says this in verse 11, whereunto I, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles for, for the which cause... I also suffer these things. Did you hear that? Paul says, listen, I realize that preaching the gospel is what got me in this, in this position in the first place. I realize that me 
being obedient and me being passionate about sharing what God has done for me. Again, you have to go back and remember Paul's history. Many of you already know that. A, a, a Pharisee, uh, he, a persecutor of the church, somebody who was, who was trying to, to kill the church of Jesus Christ. So you know what? I, I realize, and he's going to say, I'm, I'm the least. But he says, I, I realize that that's the reason why I'm in the position that I am. So that poses another question to me. What if we knew it was going to cost our freedom? What if, what if we knew the chances of us being obedient to the calling of the gospel ministry, of sharing the gospel with the lost? What if we knew that it, it truly, not, not just maybe one day in America it'll get to this place, but what if we truly knew it was there and we knew that it would cost us our freedom, it would cost us financially, it would even maybe cost us our life. If we knew all those things, would we share the gospel with those in need? And I think the pious Christian answer today is, oh, I would. But are we faithfully doing it now? Is our life, is that what our life is made up of? Is that what, is that what we are about as the children of God, recipients of God's grace, given the gift, being illuminated through the gospel? Is that what we're doing now without any persecution, without any threat of our life, without any of those things? Is that what our life is about? He says, I, I'm suffering these things because of the gospel, because I, I, I preached it, because I, I'm an apostle. I, that's what God has called me to do, and, it, and it's cost me these things. But he says this, but, but I'm not ashamed of it. I, I, it doesn't make me sad. It doesn't make me regretful. It doesn't make me say, well, maybe I shouldn't have been so bold in my way. Maybe I shouldn't have been, been, been so outspoken about my faith, and maybe I wouldn't have had it. He said, listen, I'm not ashamed of this. Why would Paul say I'm not ashamed of it? He says, because, or for, I know who I, who, who, whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What day? I believe the day of the Lord. I love that. I, I love that. that. That day of judgment, that day when I stand before the Lord. I, I, listen, I know that, that God is able to protect and guard I'm persuaded about it. I'm convinced. I have no doubt about it. And so for me to give my all for him and for that to cost my, that, that to be the, what cost me my life, that's, an actual, that's actually an, a, a reward. Think about that. So I, I think Paul had his mindset right and I think our mindset in 2016 is off. We, we, it's something that we, we fear. It's something that we, we, we want to avoid at all costs. And I'm not saying that death is fun. Death is an enjoyable. I'm not saying that. But Paul truly saw it as a door. He, he, he realized, listen, that's the finish line. I mean, at that point in time, I, that's what it's all about. Not this, not this life and the substance that it, that, it, that it presents at face value, but every, every eternal purpose and every eternal plan of God is tied in with this temporal realm. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. What am I doing for eternity? What is my life? What impact is my life making for all of eternity? And again, Paul saw that. And that's why he said at one point in time, listen, for me to die is gain. You know where he said that from? A Roman prison cell. And then he goes on and he says, you know what? But if God keeps me around, I realize that's more beneficial to you but man, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. And then Paul got it. He realized. He, 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 he had known what fame was. He had knew, known what prominence was. He, he, he knew what all those things, what, what power was. He just go into a, a town and a city and haul people to jail. Paul knew all those things, and, and, and Jesus Christ transformed him. And he realized, listen, all those things are lost. That, all those things are but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, God. I believe Paul you know, would say, you know, he, he gave his life for me. Not, not just for something nice or something kind, not for something 
uh, that was useful in this world. God became flesh. And he gave his life to purchase what I could never gain myself. He, he did something beyond my understanding. And I could never repay that. I could never give back to God anything close to what he's given to me. However, it's a privilege to share this good news that, that brought me to salvation, that gave me this gift of eternal life. I can share it with others, even to the point of it costing me everything. And I'm not ashamed of that because I know who gave it to me. I know who's called me. I know he's protected. I know, I know he's got my, my, my life no matter what. And so it's committed to him against that day. It reminds Timothy, in, all, in light of all this, to guard, to protect what's been entrusted to him. And he says in verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep or guard by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. See, Timothy's job, just as every true minister of Jesus Christ, every true Christian, his job was to guard the sound teaching that had already been under attack in this day. We have to understand, this is just but, but a couple decades removed from Jesus starting the, the church. I mean, there, there wasn't a whole lot of time going on, and even in that short amount of time, the truth had already be, been under attack through distortion, through addition, through su su uh, subtraction, deletion. The looting down of the truth, it, it was already existing there. And it was already causing problems within the church in its infancy. So Paul, he's charging Timothy, he's gonna, in the next chapter, address these things in further detail, why Timothy is supposed to guard the sound teaching, the true doctrine that was delivered. But he says this to reveal these realities that sadly still exist 2,000 years later. He says this to Timothy, listen, people are gonna turn away from the truth. People aren't gonna wanna hear what's, what's challenging to their soul. People aren't gonna wanna hear something that moves them away from fleshly pleasure to spiritual obedience. People don't, they're not going to want to do that. People will want what pleases people. People want the blessings, but people don't want the responsibility that comes along with blessings. It says this in verse 15 as we get ready to wrap it up. It says, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Think about that. Think about all the labor, think about all the stoning, all the, all the beating, standing before Caesar already, all the things that Paul has gone through for the sake of the gospel, all, all, all the, the investment into the lives of men like Timothy and, and others, all of this work for the gospel, for the kingdom of God, and here he sits in a Roman cell knowing that his life is at, at the end, and he's trying to encourage Timothy, and, and he knows in the back of his mind there have already been so many people, so much that he refers to all of Asia turning away from this doctrine, from, from this true teaching. Again, remember what I told you about Ephesus. It was kind of the epicenter uh, uh, of that, that region of Asia. And Timothy was pastoring there. So maybe this brings a little insight to the distress and the fear that Paul addressed in this letter to Timothy. People turning away from the faith, people making up their own truth, people coming up and, and saying, hey, you don't have to trust in Jesus for salvation. People coming up and saying, listen, all you gotta do is pray this prayer. People saying all kinds of things, deleting, deluding, adding to it. All these things to the truth. And Timothy, as a young minister, and his mentors in prison who had been bold and who had gone through so much, is writing to him saying, listen, I'm burdened that you're going through this struggle, but don't be timid, don't be afraid. Remember what's been given to you. Remember what's been entrusted to you and guard it and protect it and serve with passion, realizing that, listen, even if it costs you everything, it's all worth it for the kingdom of God. Paul says, you know what? I know that all them that are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy. You know, we don't know a whole lot about those two, but again, obviously Timothy knew who he was, who he was referring to, maybe some influential people, 
that, that at one point in time, you know, we could speculate about all kinds of things, different, different theories and stuff, but obviously he knew he, who he was referring to, and it meant something. Holy Spirit inspired him to put those two men. Listen, it's like those two people. He says, the Lord give mercy unto the house of, an, of Anisperus, for he often, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Again, Timothy knew what Paul was referring to. The, 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 the turning away, these people, he knew, as, he knew of Onesiphorus. And the truth is this, it was going to be difficult for Timothy to press on. It was going to be difficult for true believers to press on. But that's why Paul was encouraging. Keep the fire. Stick with the stuff. Stay true. Even when the majority doesn't want to do it. Even when it has become unpopular. And Paul was given, listen, you and I have to take from this as well. Sometimes God shows us in small ways. Sometimes God shows us with the minority just how important it is. Again, this, this servant that ministered to Paul was unfazed by any stigma that might have been attached to Paul. Oh, Paul the apostle, you know, he was just going around because he faced these texts. He's just going around trying to gain a following. He's not a true apostle. That's why, again, he, he's writing in these letters saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. His, his apostleship was under attack. His sincerity, writing to the, to the Corinthians. Listen, you know, he said even to the Corinthians, we're not taking anything from you. Even though as a minister, we, we, we have the right and it's, and it's correct for us to live of the gospel. To the Corinthians, he says, you know what? I'm not taking anything from you because of the attack on the sincerity in which we're serving the Lord. Again, he faced all of these things and he's telling Timothy, now listen, there's, there's somebody that was willing to serve the Lord and, and to, to minister, even to me, no matter what, no matter what, what it cost him. And today, this, this servant of God still served as an example as he did for Timothy, for us. What example? The contrast between the faithful and the unfaithful. He just said two men had, had left the faith, just like all those in, in, in Asia. And then he points out this man who had been faithful, who had been strong when others were weak, who had been trustworthy when others were unreliable, who had been steadfast and remained in the gospel service no matter what it may have cost him. Again, the many in, in Asia that Paul was referring to, I believe portrayed the very things that he had been warning Timothy against. Cowardice, shame, self-indulgence, and unfaithfulness to God. The servant demonstrated the characteristics that Paul had been telling Timothy he needed to have. Courage, love, self-discipline, boldness, and faithfulness in the gospel service. I believe these, these, these negative and, and these positive examples given to Timothy through, through Paul, serves an example for us today. So I believe God has preserved his eternal word to strengthen not only Timothy's resolve, but to give us encouragement and to strengthen our resolve, to be counted among those who are willing to stand and shoulder the responsibility that's, that comes along with the blessings of eternal life. To stand shoulder to shoulder with those who, who, who throughout the church's history have said, you know what? No matter what it costs us, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how much of the minority we are, we are still going to stay true to the gospel ministry, to the truth of the word of God. We're not going to be, we're not going to be waving back and forth between what, what the culture, we are going to stay true to the calling of God. And that leads us to the last note tonight. Despite what the majority may think or do, in our lives, we need to protect the truth. We need to press on. We need to keep the fire burning 
And we need to stick with the stuff and carry the responsibility that accompanies the blessing, even if we're in the minority. And that, that's a mouthful. I understand that may be a, a lot to try to remember, but again, I encourage you to write it down. I've, seen, I've said this before. Even I've seen many of you take pictures to try to, to get that snapshot of it. Listen, listen. It, it, it's going to be it's going to be that way in your job. It's going to be that way in your family. It's going to be that way in, in, in the in the cultures that we live in. But we've got to make sure that we stay with this, the, the stuff, keep the fire burning, stay true to what the responsibility is that's been given to us. No matter what the majority does. At this point, as the musicians come, I'm going to share something. I'll be, I may share it. Uh, we're going to be starting. Um, not this Thursday, but next Thursday, um, uh, outreach training. And so we've already we've said this before. If you, you say, you know what, I'd like to have some more tools. I'd like to have some encouragement. I'd like to get a little more practice uh, sharing the gospel. People come. This Thursday, we, we have normal outreach. But after that, the first three Thursdays in April is outreach training. And we're sitting down and going over some, you know, the Romans Road, of course, trying to encourage you to memorize that, some other scriptures, also given scenarios and give us some useful tips and, and scriptures in certain circumstances, allowing you to sit across the table for another brother or sister and, and sharing the gospel and facing some of the questions and, and going through some of those things uh, to, again, strengthen our resolve and help us in this responsibility that's been given to us. Um, but I was encouraged last week after outreach, I got a, an email and a text from um, Brother Reggie and Miss Julie. And uh, they said, I just want to share this with you. Just thank you for uh, preaching and staying true to the mission of the church, and just kind of went on like that. And, and uh, they said, but they were out, and they were, they were uh, knocking doors and, and inviting people to church and, and handing out the invite cards. And uh, they came across a lady who was out doing yard work, and they sat there and talked to her and, and gave her the gospel, and she listened. And at the end of it, she had a lifestyle that she wasn't willing to give up. And that lifestyle wasn't, uh, she, she wasn't, shunned or outcast by them. They just simply showed the love of Christ and gave the gospel uh, 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 in, in the plan of salvation. And again, at the end of it, I'm, I'm not interested. They said they went on to the next, I think, four houses. And Brother Reggie said, I, I didn't hear the, the leaf blower going for the whole time that we were going. So he said, so I'm guessing that she was reading the track and, and reading the, uh, the card, the invite card. And so when we finished up those houses, we, we began to walk back to our vehicle, and she was marching straight at us on the sidewalk. And Julie said, honestly, I was scared. I thought she was just going to tell us we had no business, and, and who do we think we are, and, and all those things, and, and she stopped them. So Julie was going through her head, God, please give me the words, please help me with this. And, and uh, the lady said, you know what? I just want to thank you for what you're doing. There's been a lot of people that essentially condemn me and don't, don't share with me what you have shared with me. And I just want to thank you. And, and I thought, man, what a blessing. You know, the enemy would have us just like that, just seeing that, just fear gripping. The enemy would have us do and say, well, did she get saved? I don't know. Maybe she has and I have no idea. Maybe she took that track and prayed. Never know. Maybe she won't, but maybe she will down the road. But seeds were planted or seeds were watered. Because people were obedient and willing to say, you know what? There's people just down the street that need the light. They need the gospel. So we gather here and we have fellowship and we, we, we get together and we have ministries. And all those ministries and all that fellowship and all this gathering is to bring unity among us so that we're on the same page. That we have the same heart, the same mind, striving together for the, the, the gospel, the faith of the gospel so that we're strong, so that when we do go through our prison experience, so we do go through our, our difficult times and our distresses and our loss, that we're here for each other, strengthening each other, reminding and encouraging each other, even in distress, that the responsibility doesn't go away. Again, that's what Paul was doing, that's what Paul was encouraging, and that's what we need to take from tonight. We're gonna go through difficult times. This life brings us those things, hurt, loss, disappointment, discouragement. It brings all those things. The apostle Paul faced it. Timothy was facing it. But none of those things, the temptation, the pull of the world, the business that, that could get wrapped up, uh, lives could be wrapped up in, all those things were real then too. But he was encouraging, and we're, we're encouraged here tonight with this. Stick with the stuff. 
Make sure that we're staying true to the calling. Passionately keeping the gifts that God's given us flame and alive and using them for his kingdom and for his glory. And so now I encourage you, take these notes. Use them now. This is what this, this, this study series is. Noted. Take these things, Christian things, and apply them. Use them for future reference. Let's pray tonight. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for allowing us to be here. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, God, you have given us something that we could never repay. We, we could never repay the debt of love that we owe. And um, God, we're just thankful. Lord, help us to see your grace and your gifts and your calling. Lord, as the blessings that that responsibility is coupled with and, and that we would see this responsibility as, as a joy, as the Apostle Paul did, as, as he was encouraging Timothy to see. Even an affliction, even if it costs us something, to see that it, it was all worth it in the scope of eternity. If we can lift our eyes up from this world and, and set them on, on eternal things, then we can see that it all has to do with that, with your kingdom, with your glory, seeing your kingdom built, seeing your glory resound in this world. And Lord, help us be steadfast. Help us be faithful. Help us be like that servant that was willing to face shame and, and criticism, that was willing to face even imprisonment himself to encourage another brother. Help us take these notes tonight and apply them in our life. Or help us respond now in this invitation. What if we've been maybe selfish or maybe we've been too busy. Maybe we've lost sight of, of what it's all about. Maybe, maybe the thought of, of having a year left and, and what we're investing our lives in right now is, has pricked hearts. Lord, help us respond the right way. I'm going to praise you for what you do. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand tonight. As I sing tonight, maybe you just come tonight and say, God, I want to invest more than what I've been investing in your kingdom. Just come as you sing. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sands that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that
Thank you so much again for being here tonight. I just want to remind you to keep uh, the Garcia family in prayer uh, and as they're having their funeral tomorrow. Also, it's good to see Brother Stone here tonight and his family. And uh, this is from Coastline Baptist Church. Many of you, or some of you might remember them coming through a few, uh, several years back. And uh, they planted a church down there in Corpus Christi. And uh, this is where the Perez family came by letter from. And uh, just a, a blessing. So if you haven't met them, uh, again, just a, a blessing of the family. And uh, uh, doing good work down there. It's good, encouraging to hear uh, the Lord blessing the work. And uh, he was sharing, you know, it's a, it's a different world to plant a church in. Because they've planted a church before. And, um, and uh, it's just a different world. And so, well, we, we planted one last year, and we definitely know that. There's different challenges that uh, Brother J.T. and Allison and, and, and Providence is facing. It's just different, um, different, different areas. And so, uh, if you meet them, uh, or if you met them, go by and say hi if you haven't. Uh, meet them tonight. And also, keep them in your prayers as they're doing that work of getting Coastline Baptist Church thriving. Amen. All right. Let's, uh, don't forget about tomorrow night, uh, outreach, 6 o'clock. Uh, meals, fried chicken, and all the, the fixings and stuff, and so um, child care available as well. So uh, that starts at 6, and uh, again, just kind of reminder, we, we uh, try to have uh, the devotion at 6.15, and I try to get everybody out by 6.30, um, and so that's kind of the plan. So uh, tomorrow night, and then outreach training the next three weeks after that. Um, also, don't forget to invite people. We still are doing Resurrection Celebration Month, so we're, start, we're continuing on. Uh, tomorrow night, that's a, lot, a large part of what we're doing, handing out those invite cards as well in the community uh, like we did last week. Um, so hopefully you'll come and help and be a part of that as well. Let's pray and we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you again for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house. Thank you for your word. I pray that um, you would help us take this with us and apply it in our lives. And, and God, we would be passionate about serving you, uh, realizing that that's what this, this temporal period is all about. Now that we're redeemed, now that we're your children, is living as those ambassadors, being the representative, sharing uh, the, the, the light with those in darkness and not keeping it hidden. Um, Lord, help us to, to be steadfast in that. Help us be encouraged in that. Again, help us to encourage one another uh, in that. Lord, help us to, to remind each other uh, that we've got to stay steadfast no matter what difficulty, prison, uh, distress, fear, uh, no matter what, being faithful. And uh, Lord, we pray you take us home safely and bring us back again at our next appointed time. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.